Good evening, everyone. My name is Eve Haskell, um, uh, Professor of Radiology and Interventional Radiology, University of Virginia. Welcome to this um, keynote event in our continuing series of lectures. The University of Virginia, Department of Radiology and Medical Imaging. Uh, all of our lectures are online. A lot of varied topics, scientific, moral, ethical, societal issues. And tonight, a particularly interesting topic, looking at applied ethics in radiology. I'm very excited to have Dr. Eric J. Keller back with us several years later to go back into this area of applied ethics in radiology. Dr. Keller is finishing his training at Stanford University before he moves out of academia and starts practice. But I want you all to understand the extent of time and exposure that he's had speaking on related topics worldwide, giving many, many grand rounds and talks around the world on these topics. Specifically, he's built out programs on applied ethics and radiology and held panels. I've been uh, pleased to be both in the audience and occasionally part of the discussions as well. And it's kind of an interesting question to think about this because in interventional radiology, we are gradually thinking more and more about ethics as we obviously recognize that we're individual practitioners with an office full of our own patients and not just those that are referred to us for problem solving in hospital or outside where our interaction may be brief. Um, but we start to engage questions like futility or exams that may not be appropriate or otherwise that are very much ongoing conversations in ICUs, by surgical um, services as well, but really have to be front and central in interventional radiology, particularly as we have palliative roles as well. But the larger question is, where is this in diagnostic radiology? Because when I have um, briefly looked over curricula in diagnostic radiology conferences, such as the RSNA, it's hard to find conversations on applied ethics and diagnostic radiology. And if you were to make a simple stereotype, if there's a request, then the exam gets done. And yet it's far more complicated than that. I'm excited to see where you're gonna take us with this tonight, Dr. Keller. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Haskell. It is an absolute pleasure to be back. I'm gonna share my screen here. Give me two beats, one and two. So yeah, great to be back. Um, Good news is, is that I'm happy to report that this summer I'm actually going to be moving a lot closer to you all and just be one state over at Delaney Radiology down in Wilmington, North Carolina. So I'll be a lot closer if we want to keep having these conversations. But as Dr. Haskell was mentioning, it is interesting. I've, I've spent a little bit more time focusing on um, applied ethics and interventional radiology, and I'll discuss more why in a second. But it's always been with this... Uh, this focus on the bigger picture, which is how do you do, how do you approach ethics in a more engaging, thoughtful, maybe specially specific way throughout healthcare? I kind of use IR as an initial, initial lab in a way, but in diagnostic radiology, yeah, a lot of those conversations also aren't there, even less so, I think, than interventional radiology. So I'm going to share a bit about that. And a little bit more, I, I am going to make this case base, and the, the cases are different than the last time that we, we hung out together, but I also want to devote quite a bit of time up front of talking about exactly that. Why, why are common approaches to ethics maybe less effective at behavior kit change or engaging people in, say, diagnostic radiology, and then what, what can you do about it? Is there a better way of approaching it, thinking about it, engaging people about these issues? So to start, I'm just gonna put out three questions for you to, to think about. And in thinking about them, I'm gonna share my answer to them. And you'll, we'll have these questions kind of throughout this talk as well. So the first question is, what do you think is the most pressing ethical issue in radiology? I think Dr. Haskell mentioned that I think in IR, I would say it's it's probably futility, this idea of feeling like the Hail Murray pass request for potentially appropriate procedures. In radi diagnostic radiology, you have that too under the term appropriateness. Um, but perhaps maybe there are those unique issues like misses. How do you handle that major miss made by a colleague or yourself on the, the last exam? 
And what do we think about that? Do we have conversations about that? And then have you ever read the ACR Code of Ethics? Uh, my answer is yes, once a while ago. But have you? And then how often do you encounter issues that you would consider an ethical issue in your work? Do you feel like that you basically it's getting at, do you think that this is a topic worth talking about? Do you think that radiologists frequently encounter ethical issues that they have to navigate? And we actually have some data on the answers to those because there was this survey and I, I actually shared this data last time that I, I spoke with you all at UVA that they basically asked 400 some radiologists and trainees about ethics and they found that only about a, a fourth of trainees and third of faculty said that, you know, I've, I've ever read the AMA or ACR's code of ethics. So the majority of people have not, not read those, those code of ethics. Uh, when you ask them, trainees were more likely to have had prior ethics education, but a lot of people still felt like that their ethics education was, was insufficient. And if you look at website data, going back to that code of ethics, it's estimated only about 2% of ACR members have ever even downloaded the code of ethics document. And then they also asked, you know, have you, have you witnessed an ethical dilemma in your work? And interestingly, uh, only 50%, 56% of radiologists said that I've encountered an ethical dilemma in my work. And that raises a few questions, I guess, for me is that one, it makes you wonder, right? Are code of ethics ineffective, or at least maybe not the best way of engaging people about these topics? And then is radiology practice, diagnostic radiology specifically, is, is it unique? Does it have less ethical issues? Are we uniquely insulated? Or is it just that we're not equipped to identify those issues when they occur? Or maybe it's a little bit of both. And so to, to take a step back and, and think about ethics in general, I like to think that there are, are three responses we have uh, as human beings when an ethical issue occurs. So let's assume that ethical issues do routinely arise in radiology practice, because I, I do think they do, but we don't necessarily always see them. I think there are many ethical issues that pass us by, either because we intuitively know the right thing to do. So at a subconscious level, we, we navigate that ethical dilemma without thinking about it as one. And then I also think there's those cases that pass us by because we just don't see them. We're not, we're not equipped to identify them. So an example of the, the former would be, you know, you, you really want to have a drink at night. You got the, you're a scotch person. You got this, this great scotch, but you're on call and you decide not to have a drink while you're on call. Well, you've, you've navigated an ethical issue, but you maybe didn't think about it as, as one. And then you have those cases that we do see as ethical issues. It creates that cognitive dissonance in us and we navigate them. So think about, you know, one of your technologists comes in the reading room, they're, they're off service right now, and they're coming in because they're with their, their father who just got to the emergency department and they're getting a CT scan and they want to know what you think. Now you feel that tension because you want to help out this technologist. You like this technologist, they're, they're your coworker, but you know, you end up saying, you know, I, I can't really share personal health information with you without your father's permission while still being supportive of them. There you may have identified that as that you navigated this ethical issue, right, consciously. And then I think the third category are those that, that stump us. And maybe, maybe we don't identify these as much in radiology, but, and, or maybe we just don't call them ethical dilemmas, because I think usually our response to these is that we ask a friend or a mentor, and we say, hey, I'm dealing with this, this challenging situation, what would you do? I think those are the, the, the three common responses that you get to ethical dilemmas in medicine. And then it begs the question, right, why, why don't we talk about ethics then? I think a few reasons. One of the big ones is just that they're awkward. Thinking about an impaired colleague or a major miss on a scan or conflicts of interest is not something that you're bringing up colloquially in, in the reading room to make conversation. And then the other part of it is that I think sometimes we take for granted the complexity here and we view ethics as this soft, wishy-washy science without clear answers or that it's just obvious focusing on those issues that pass us by. And so I, I like to share two of my favorite uh, responses I've, I've gotten from being someone that researches ethics in the radiology world. The first was from a uh, prominent faculty member who was asking what I was doing 
looking over my shoulder and I said I was working on this ethics research and they were like, well, why are you wasting your time with that? You can't teach someone something that they should have learned in church. And then the, the other one was a response, a rejection from a major met, a radiology journal saying that, you know, this research isn't really worth people's time because ethics is a matter of personal choice. It's not a matter of scientific research or policy. So obviously I don't 100% agree with those comments, but I'm also going to say that they aren't completely wrong in the sense that ethics is hard to teach people, particularly well-educated physicians, that it's really hard to engage those folks on a meaningful level to think about these issues differently or change their behavior related to them. And the reason why is because, you know, the people that are going to show up to a talk like this one are probably ones that already think that these issues are important. They're already thinking about these issues. And if you don't think ethics and radiology is important, you're probably not going to show up to this talk in the first place. And then that issue particularly is then further exacerbated by common approaches out there and some issues with them in the ethics world. The first is that ethics education remains very heterogeneous. So the majority, many medical schools now have ethics curricula, but there is basically no uh, internal agreement across all those uh, different people leading those curricula about specific goals or competency, you know, the end game of those curricula. So it's kind of, they, they each exist in a silo and a void. So it's very heterogeneous about what's being exactly said out there. The other issue is that it tends to focus that education more on theoretical ethical concepts rather than practical direction. And it tends to use these extreme examples that aren't especially specific. And the problem with that is that most ethical issues that we face, the things that keep us up at night, are not going to be those extreme examples. Most of us instead live in this, this gray area. Those are the ethical issues that we really struggle with. And those specific issues are going to vary a bit from specialty to specialty. So the issues that keep us up as radiologists, diagnostic or interventional, are going to look a little different than trauma surgeons or OB-GYNs. Not that there aren't some commonalities, but it's just that if you teach ethics in that way, people aren't going to see themselves in it and thus not really see it as practical in their day-to-day -day lives. And I pause because there's a a chat question. Oh, if you have comments, thanks, Dr. Askell. Yep. So the reason why uh, those approaches are like that is really the product of the history of medical ethics. And I promise I'll keep this brief, not to bore you, but I think that you might find it, find it interesting for some context, is that much of medical ethics, as we talk about it today, the terms we use, the way we think about it, is a relatively recent phenomenon that really arose in the 19th and 20th century. So yes, there was a Hippocratic oath, Hippocratic corpus of works. There were previous ideas that physicians shared certain professional obligations, but this idea of ethical obligations and principles, all of that really arose out of the work of religious scholars galvanized by unethical research practices that came to light in the setting of World War II and then throughout the 20th century. Over the 20th century, those conversations became more secularized, so you, you, you lost that religious flavor. Uh, it was kind of overpowered by the field of moral philosophy. And now what you're left with is this very heterogeneous field of medical humanities and medical ethics, where a lot of healthcare systems will have an ethics consult service or uh, ethics committee, and it's made up of a wide array of characters and backgrounds from physicians, nurses, lawyers, philosophers, religious scholars, which is really just a byproduct of that heterogeneity of where it came from. And because of that heterogeneity, it actually generated a lot of different approaches to medical ethics, different ethical theories. And one of which really became really popular in medical education called principalism. And principalism is essentially the idea that there are these inherent ethical principles that we strive to uphold that can come into conflict. So autonomy, beneficence, maleficence, justice. And the reason why that became so popular is that in the wake of those uh, research practices that were coming to lie in the 20th century, a national commission was made and generated a report called the Belmont Report in the 70s, providing guidelines for human research. 
and it really popularized those terms. Now, in the original Belknap Report, there were three principles, so respect for persons, beneficence, and justice, that over time people threw in non-maleficence or do no harm as kind of the other side of the coin of beneficence. It also became popular in medical education, and you still find it. That is what is popular today on even the radiology core exam, on medical licensing exams, because it lends itself well to multiple choice questions more so than other ethical theories. So that's a lot of what's out there and why it tends to, why ethics education tends to talk in terms of these theoretical principles rather than these concrete examples or cases and stuff like that. And then a lot of this raised the question in debate, which is worth talking about a little bit because it's related to how do we talk about this in radiology is how much is ethics based on certain inherent unmalleable principles and truths throughout time and culture? Or is ethics at least somewhat influenced by the culture and people that make it up and think about it? So in other words, do you think the right way to deal with a major miss by a colleague on a prior study is driven more by certain rigid truths that wouldn't change across practices or time? Or is it some combination of some truths and principles and the perceptions and values held by you and your colleagues. That's really the debate that was going on in the ethics world and still is going on to some extent today. And the product of that was three kind of main ways of thinking about ethics. One of which is by far what's dominant out there in uh, ethics education, codes of ethics, things like that. And that's why you'll see people, the main approach to ethics are these opinion pieces, or um, codes of ethics. You don't see a lot of empiric ethics research. That's not part of the culture because what became dominant was what's called normative ethics. And what normative ethics is, is a top-down approach. The idea is that you believe that uh, the right thing to do is more based on inherent principles and should be independent of the environment that it's in. And so if you're gonna figure out the right thing to do, you start with that theory, look at the issue and say, well, you know, people should really be doing B rather than A. And you, you you're, it's through that lens that you look at people's behaviors. You write your big analysis about why people should be doing B rather than A. Problem is, is that that literature tends to be really verbose, published in places that many clinicians aren't gonna read it. And even if they do read it, people are probably gonna keep doing A to some extent because there's a reason why they're doing A in the first place. And generally people are well-intended. Right, so I think normative ethics is a great approach for generating theory, but maybe not for behavior change. And so there was this other approach applied to ethics, which is less popular, but is not a new thing. It was around in like the 80s and 90s. And it instead works a little more bottom up with the belief that the practical right thing to do is gonna be influenced by some extent by the environment in which that decision is being made in. And so if you wanna engage people, you gotta start with your ethics market research. You need to start with an understanding of how people are currently thinking about an issue and why, and then use that understanding with ethical theory to empower people to maybe navigate that issue better. That's really the, the, the tension there. And then just for completeness sake, the, the third is meta-ethics focused more on theory, terminology, what is an ethical issue? Is there a difference between moral and ethics? And we'll just leave that one there. So my, my theory, is that if your primary goal is behavior change, if your goal is to say, I think that we in radiology should handle misses this way, then I would argue that a especially specific applied ethics approach is gonna be a lot more effective at engaging people and behavior change than that normative top-down approach with codes of ethics and kind of writing at people. And when you engage people and talk about ethics, if you even use that word at all, you would need to make sure then that your presentations and information are approachable, relatable, and intuitive because you really want people to see themselves in those conversations. So I've never heard anyone in a reading room or flow suite be like, wait a second, everyone, what principles are we talking about here that are in conflict to make a decision? Instead, I think most clinicians actually think in terms of two ethical theories intuitively, which is casuistry and virtue ethics, meaning that when we're faced with an ethical dilemma, I think what we tend to do is we tend to say, well, how is this situation like other situations that I have encountered or heard of, and then use that to try and navigate it. 
And I think we tend to try and choose an action the best uphold, upholds common values of our own and then those of our stakeholders. So that is very reflective of what the ethical theories of casuistry and virtue ethics are about. We just don't use those terms in radiology. So it's just to say that I think that if you wanna talk about ethics, you should talk about it in that way. So using more of a case-based approach, talking about the values, what we're trying to do, rather than talk about you know, autonomy, beneficence, things like that. It kind, of, it kind of pushes us away, it distances us from it feeling practical to our day-to-day -day lives. And so my experiment was that I was alluding to in the introduction is that at the end of 2019, I thought, well, what if I test out this theory in interventional radiology as a kind of lab? It's a really nice testing ground because IR is a relatively new specialty, a relatively smaller specialty without much existing ethics culture. So the phrase ethics in IR does, didn't really exist that much. Not that people never talked about these issues. It's just that you're not competing against something. And so what I started with, true to that applied form, was I actually started with a series of letters to the editor that Dr. Haskell actually helped me with in JVIR, and then some surveys to test the waters and try and get a sense to start. How are IRs already thinking about these issues? What's the language that they're using? You know, what, what do they identify as the problems if they identify these as issues at all? And then I created a multi-institutional working group to start generating ethics literature, presentations, start having these conversations and developing this applied approach that led to a bunch of presentations, a bunch of publications. It wasn't necessarily a slam dunk, but you know, we're here four to five years later and ethics and IR is now a thing at a lot of major IR conferences and self-sustaining without me now. And other people are doing it. It's not just me leading this charge in any way. So I do think that that is, you know, it's, it's an N of one, obviously very biased, lots of limitations. I can hear Dr. Haskell is a prior journal editor already, but I do think that it's probably a more effective approach. And so just to give you an example of something that we did kind of to show you that applied flavor. So I'm gonna use consent as an example. And the problem with consent is, it's kind of interesting to me because consent is such a ubiquitous thing in healthcare that we experience and do. But data suggests again and again, study, study, that we're not very good at it. A lot of patients don't feel particularly informed that they made an informed decision, you know, that they felt empowered to do it, a lot of things like that. And so the, the question is, well, what do you do about that? Why is that? It's not because we're trying to do consent poorly. We just fall victim to a lot of things that undermine our efforts, things like time constraints, variable health literacy and learning style amongst our patients low baseline understanding of what we do. They may have never heard of a hip aspiration or the biopsy that you're going to do or anything else like that. And you might not have the time to really get them there to make an informed decision. And so what do you do? Well, if people are already well-intended and trying to do a good job and still not doing a great job of consent, well, writing a big opinion piece telling them that they're not doing a good job of consent isn't gonna do anything. So you gotta think differently. And so the way that we kind of took on this problem was, well, what if we made better patient decision aids to take advantage of dead time in the patient workflow? And decision aids are just standardized handouts or videos that give balanced information on the risk benefits and alternatives of a procedure and patient-friendly language. And so we, we made these with focus groups. We completed two prospective trials at two centers where people were randomized to receive one or not, trying to talk to their physician. Physicians were blind, blinded whether the, you know, whether we'd given this to their patient or not. And, and it worked great. Patients, despite changing nothing about that conversation itself, not adding more time to it, anything, patients felt like they had much better understanding, satisfaction. They felt like they'd spent more time with their clinician, that they'd answer their questions better without changing anything itself. It's just taking care of dead time while they're waiting to talk to you. So that's an example of trying to kind of re-engineer the workflow or think about it differently rather than just writing about theory and opinions to approach an ethical issue. So going forward, um, I think some things that might be productive, where does that leave us? I think maybe a better way to do medical ethics education is similar to how we approach other medical knowledge where 
you know, you, you can keep it general and more theoretical in med school where you kind of talk about those basic principles and things like that. But then when you get to residency, I think you need to shift to this more applied, especially specific knowledge and application, much like we do with medical knowledge itself, uh, sci like scientific knowledge itself. And although curricula do exist, as Dr. Haskell is mentioning, it's not really this, this approach. There's, there are a few publications out there in the radiology literature of making an ethics curriculum and trialing it. And you know they survey people and people say, yeah, this was interesting, but it's not like it's catching on and really is a broad thing. So I think there's room to say, you know, could you develop some sort of standardized radiology ethics curriculum and trial it? And then in doing that, does that inspire other specialties to try this more applied, especially specific approach to better engage people and start these conversations? That's kind of where I'm at with this entire theory right now. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to transition to more of those case-based examples to kind of take on in the time that we have left two to three specific issues and, and kind of talk through them to provide some practical guidance. So I'm not just talking to you about the theory the entire time. So here we go. Case number one is you get a scan, you get this scan that you're reading, a CT abdomen and pelvis for a patient with abdominal pain that's admitted. Uh, they were admitted with a submassive saddle PE that your colleague read uh, about a week ago or so. And that prior, it was a prior CTA chest abdomen and pelvis. And you very quickly notice, well, there's this giant adrenal cell carcinoma that's invading the inferior vena cava. No mention of it on the prior report. So the question is, what do you do next with that? Do you, do you report this as a new finding? You know, this is a week later, you say, oh, there's this, this mass here. You don't really talk about the prior study. Do you report it as being there previously and kind of give your colleague an FYI? Do you report it as being there and tell leadership about it, kind of submit it as a formal M&M, or do you do a combo of those two and tell your colleague and leadership? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue that I would say that the last two are probably the better way of approaching it, and I'll, I'll tell you why, but I do think the exact mechanism that is, that is going to be a little bit practice specific. So let's talk about misses. I think it's a great common example, and going back to this idea of not saying that we deal with an ethical dilemma on a regular basis, I, I think that we do, and I think this is a common example one in diagnostic radiology is how do we handle these? Everyone, everyone misses things, right? The, the prevalence is very variable across studies, I'll tell you. I think the more realistic number is probably three to 5% that it's been estimated that in real time, cranking through that work list that we probably miss meaningful things about three to 5% of the times. But some older studies suggest like if you look retrospectively at things that maybe up to 30% of the times we miss something meaningful, I think that number is hard for me to believe. I like to believe that that three to 5% is more realistic, but maybe I'm, I'm rosy, have rosy colored glasses on. The, the research also, some of the research at least breaks down what type of errors we make and categorizes them differently. So it's more, it's a little more frequent that with misses, we don't see the finding at all rather than seeing the finding and interpreting it incorrectly, but those being kind of the two main types and flavors of misses. And then in that survey that I mentioned where they talked to radiologists about ethics, they actually had a few questions in there about this specific topic. And they found that 59% of people would say um, in that exact question that I asked you that they would report their colleagues miss to leadership. And they also asked them, well, what if the miss was your own? Would you comment on it that it was there previously? And one in four people said, yeah, I would, I would still say, you know, that it was there, there previously, despite, you know, you're, you're admitting your own fault, essentially. And this is one of the quotes from it, talking more about just FYI, your colleagues saying, you know, we all miss things. It's just a product of, of being human and radiology and that I had probably let the, I reported it appropriately and then let my colleague know about the miss. So one part of principalism that I do find helpful is this idea of trying to identify what's at conflict or the tension. I just don't quite think in terms of principles so much. And so for this, I think in misses, 
we the thing at tension is that we do have this ethical and moral obligation to protect patients, right? I think that most of us, if not all of us, would agree that ignoring the myths would be wrong. We should let the care team know and so they can treat the patient appropriately. However, we also have this social contract with our colleagues, even those that we don't like very much, that most of us would agree that the publicly shaming our colleague or calling the patient, telling them to sue them or reporting it to a state medical board is probably also wrong and inappropriate. And that's an inappropriate response to human error that we make. And so the question is, is, is how do you balance those tensions and respond to human error appropriately? And the ACR actually provides uh, some guidance on this. Uh, it's just not branded under the label of ethics. Instead, it's in that non-interpretive skills document, which if you've taken the core exam or maintenance of certification, you may have come across under this concept of the just culture model, which is essentially that there are three types of uh, three types of errors that people make, and then the appropriate response to those behaviors or events, and that being human errors, at-risk behavior, and reckless behavior. I would argue that I think most of our misses in diagnostic radiology are probably more that, that human error category. It's not really at-risk behavior or reckless behavior. So we should report them and learn from them and try and protect against those minority of cases that maybe are that at risk or reckless behavior, but we should be thoughtful in how we report and talk about them. And so my takeaway and take on this is, yes, this is gonna happen, we're human, it's inherent in our work. As I said, I think that patients and treatment teams have a right to know about them, and so do our colleagues to learn from them. Um, you know, we learn from those M&Ms and misses, and I think it makes us better as a community if we talk about it in a thoughtful way. Um, I think a discourage, another discouraging thing is that we often worry about the litigation associated with misses in diagnostic radiology. And I think it's just important to throw out there that there have been quite a few studies of malpractice claims basically showing that disclosure mistakes and misses tends to have the opposite effect, that it tends to prevent lawsuits rather than igniting them because a lot of malpractice claims when they talk to patients are fueled by this lack of transparency that people feel where they feel like something is was or still is being hidden from them or unjustly treated. And so that disclosure tends to, if anything, um, uh, kind of pacify the situation rather than exacerbating it. And then as I was mentioning, I think the exact workflow is gonna be a little bit culturally specific. It would be nice if your practice has a, a formal way of anonymously reporting these, so then you can think about it in a thoughtful way. And the reason why I think that that method is better than just the FYI to your colleague alone is because we as humans tend to be limited in our ability of honestly evaluating ourselves. And in the ethics world, there's this term called bounded ethicality to describe that, which is essentially that we tend to be able, more likely to justify our own behaviors, even though we would condemn that same behavior if someone else did it, because we're able to justify to ourselves, we know our reason for doing things. That's what they mean by bounded ethicality. And so that's why I think it's important to have some sort of external review, both for things like misses and conflicts of interest because of that, that limitation of self-evaluation. Okay, we're gonna keep moving. So, Case number two, and we're gonna talk about uh, medical social media. So these are two hypothetical posts. Let's say this one is by um, one of our, your diagnostic radiology trainees after a night on call. Dark Arts here says, any guess what this is? Someone had a little too much fun this weekend, hashtag foreign body, hashtag a little too far with some you know, abdominal radiographs there. And then the, the second case, let's say this is one of our IR folks. Now, first filter out Friday got a little dicey, not a bad result considering the effort to remove this thing, but a hashtag vascular surgeon left in there for eight years, hashtag malpractice. You can see the floral there, picture of the, the patient's uh, skin and uh, timestamp. So two hypothetical questions for this one. Uh, how do you feel about these posts? You know, is, is this fine? Uh, if, if you saw this, if this were your trainees or colleagues or, or you, do you think there's an issue of patient privacy or dignity there, or issue of professional respect? Uh, obviously my answer is gonna be that 
one of the, the latter two, right, which I'll talk about more, that I do think that these start to bring up those questions more so of, of patient dignity, a little bit with the patient privacy, with the timestamp and temporal relationship of when it's posted, and then probably the professional respect too of the, the cross-specialty bashing. And then the more meta question for you, which I don't necessarily have a strong opinion or conclusion for is who owns an anonymized medical story or case? Is it the patient? Is it the clinician that took care of them? Or is it no one, a public good, if it's truly anonymized? I've struggled with this idea a bit because I, I think it probably depends to some extent of how that story is being used and presented. If you're presenting as kind of a notch on someone's a belt or a story about a person or the patient that that doesn't feel like we own that. It feels like you stole it and that's not really good to share in the public light. If your intention is instead education and you're saying, hey, this is a case that I did, well, then maybe that's more of that public good or that you own that story because you're sharing your experience. You're not taking someone else's. Um, but that's a very squishy answer, I realize. But I use that as an introduction to talk about this topic. And the reason why I wanted to bring this up is because I actually think that medical social media ethics is one of the biggest growing ethical issues in medicine in general, radiology as well, that remains largely underappreciated. And I say that because whether you use social media or not, I'm going to share some data with you to try and impress you. So this data is a little limited and old, but actually an estimated 90% of physicians use social media personally and 65% professionally, meaning posting about what they do at work or to promote their practice. 85% estimated the general public uses social media to seek, interact with, and consume healthcare information and advice. Uh, medical social media has a bunch of really positive aspects that have come to light uh, evolving over the last decade or so. It's really this interesting forum for the rapid exchange of ideas, advocacy, and collaborations to the point that a lot of actually valuable studies have been completed, including in radiology by groups formed solely over social media and collaboration that way. We also saw this really great kind of open access radiology education that occurred during the pandemic to help people connect and learn radiology. So it's a super powerful and beneficial tool. But of course, it also has a lot of risks that I feel like are sometimes underappreciated. The most obvious, I think, that people think about is the patient privacy piece, but there's also this idea of patient dignity, how we talk about people, conflicts of interests with how much we disclose, whether we're paid by you know, company A when we're flaunting their device on social media, and then also information accuracy. There's no peer review for what we talk about. There's a little bit of data on those topics to dig into a little more. So most people are not posting pictures with people's patients' names and MRNs, but some actually do. Uh, there's one study out there of a thousand tweets where they found an incidence of 2% that explicitly violate HIPAA in some degree. And that might seem like a small number, but if you say that UVA radiology has 135 or so faculty and trainees, and 65% use social media professionally daily and 2% violate HIPAA, then that's one to two HIPAA violations a day at one institution. So it adds up. But the thing that I'd like to talk about more is this, this dignity piece. So I think actually the more common issue out there that I've encountered on medical social media is where inherent in us in radiology and IR, we're a very visual specialty. We like to share these rare cases and sensational cases on this public forum in close proximity when they occur, because it's fresh in our mind, right? It just happened. And so, you know, that complex filter case might be the only one like it that week. And if a patient or someone close to them saw that, it wouldn't be that hard to know who it was about because they have your information and your institution that it's associated with. But the other part of that is the, the flip side of that coin is the patient dignity part that in healthcare, it's really easy to become numb to death and suffering. And people have written about this, they call it gallows humor, this protective mechanism. It's, it's kind of like making light of that foreign body, right? Is that in a reading room, it might not seem that weird. Uh, you might even laugh about it, right? 
But in the public light of social media, it cheapens that person's or loved one's traumatic or embarrassing experience, a punchline or a notch in someone's belt. And the issue with that is that it really degrades that patient's trust. And that's really at the core of our relationship with people, not just that trust with you, but also in healthcare in general. And then I already mentioned the information accuracy piece and conflicts of interest, tribalism being the other part of that, which was alluded to a little bit in those examples of that there's been this, this interesting like cross-specialty bickering type thing going on. I think also kind of degrades that public perception of us when these specialties are like interfighting in this weird way on social media. And I have a little bit of additional data on this just because of that applied ethics in our group, at least in the IR world, where we, we interviewed a bunch of folks across specialties, both people completed training and in training about what do you perceive as kind of the main ethical issues on medical social media to try and get a sense of characterizing what are the main issues here? We kind of came up with these six buckets and topics. And then we took a popular IR hashtag and a popular general medical hashtag and looked at 500 consecutive tweets in both and tried to say, well, how often is there any like sniff of one of these issues coming up in those tweets? And the punchline is, Again, small percentages, but it adds up, right? Like between zero to 3.6%. And then in IR, a little more frequent issues with things like patient privacy and conflicts of interest, which is inherent in exactly what I was saying earlier that you know we're gonna be a little more likely than the general hashtag med Twitter to share a specific case or a specific device or company. And then we dug into the conflicts of interest thing a little more recently where we, we did this study where we basically tried to capture uh, hashtags that would be by specialties that do image guided procedures, you know, or ray, uh, procedures using imaging and tried to get at the question, is there association between naming a specific device and company and being paid by them? So we, we did those consecutive tweets, look for ones where a specific device or company were named and then took the next temporal one where they're not naming it a device as like a paired control group. And then we looked at open payment data for the last 36 months, comparing you know, the company that was named to that paired one to say, is there their relationship there? Again, low prevalence, about 0.6% of those uh, posts mentioned a specific device or company. And of those that mentioned a specific device, 53% of them had been paid by that company within the last 36 months. And we excluded like small things, you know, like a meal, or something like that. So this had to be like an honorarium or something. Uh, compared to 14% amongst the controls, so 3.7 times more likely average payment, a little over 31,000 and a 0% disclosure. So there of those 80 posts and 100 mentioned, nowhere in the post itself or the profile was there any disclosure of that potential conflict. And so the takeaway here, I, I will admit, I, I use uh, X, formerly Twitter. You can follow me. That's my, my handle down there. Uh, but th so the question for me really is to not throw out the baby with the bathwater in the sense that I think there's a lot of positive aspects of medical social media. I don't think the answer is, you know, physicians shouldn't be physicians on medical social media. I think the better question is how can we do it more thoughtfully to avoid those risks? And on a personal level, I think that there's really just a lot of power in pausing before you post and doing a spot check of yourself. It's easy to just reflectively press in and go for it. But I think it's worth just ask yourself, you know, is, is this accurate? Does it maintain that patient privacy and dignity? And if you're gonna share a case, wait a few months, change some details, be cognizant of how you present it and ask yourself, okay, if the patient was me or my loved one, would I be okay if I saw uh, the physician posting this? I think there's a lot of power in just that, honestly. But at a practice level, if you're regularly going to post these cases for education or promote your practice, I think it's probably worth incorporating into your consent conversations and saying, hey, I usually promote cases. Is it okay if I would share this in my anonymized case and give people the opportunity to opt out? And at the society level, it begs the question, you know, I already shared the limitations of guidelines and codes of ethics, but would it be helpful if ACR, SIR put out some sort of guidelines on this? A lot of other specialties have started doing this. Vassar surgery was one of the most recent ones. And so sh should we do this in radiology? I actually engaged the um, ACR ethics committee about that topic 
about two years ago or so, and it was uh, crickets. So maybe not, but I, I think some people might find it helpful. Okay, last, last series of cases here, um, and we'll see if we run out of time or not, but you're on call for diagnostic radiology, and here's what's on your protocol list. You got a CTP study for negative D-dimer, a CT out in pelvis without contrast to look for active gastrointestinal bleeding, MRI total spine with without contrast for pain, thyroid ultrasound follow-up on spongiform nodules, and a CT out in pelvis with indication just no. These are all real examples from my, my moonlighting gig, by the way. And on the flip side, the procedural side, what about this? You're asked to do this hip aspiration in this 84-year-old with severe Alzheimer's dementia and multiple missions for failure to thrive. Or you're, you're on the IR side and you have this person with advanced vascular dementia, ANO times one, bed-bound, metastatic prostate cancer, failure to thrive, and the family wants a G-tube because they're, they seem not to have as much of an appetite. So this is getting at that thing that Dr. Haskell was mentioning in the introduction about there's kind of two sides of this. In the radiodiagnostic side, we tend to use the word appropriateness rather than futility when we talk about this. But how do you handle a potentially inappropriate imaging quest? You And I have actually a colleague that does this, that he's like, it's much easier for me to just protocol it and read it in the time that it would take me to have a conversation. Uh, do you reach out to them? If it, but still protocol if they're persistent or do you refuse to do it unless they give you an acceptable answer? And then on the IR side, you know, do you view cases as futile? There are IRs, I'll tell you, that feel that, you know, if I can do the procedure, then it's not futile. Or do you reach out to them and have some sort of goals of care discussion or first talk to the patient or refuse to do the procedure outright? Um, I'll tell you my personal thing is I'm probably kind of in the middle of these where I, I tend to reach out, but you know, I, I'm not gonna, it's not a hill that I'm gonna die on necessarily. And then on, on this one, I, I tend to reach out first to the referring clinician, which actually follows uh, critical care guidelines to ask them, you know, have, what, what's our end game here? And have you had that conversation with the, the family? And then if you want me to be a part of that conversation, I'm happy to be so if it hasn't occurred. So on the diagnostic side, uh, there's a lot of interest in this, a lot of data out there that there's a lot of studies done that do not meet the ACR's appropriateness criteria. So this is one example for musculoskeletal MRIs where they looked at lumbar spine MRIs for back pain, 60% did not meet uh, criteria, so inappropriate for the ACR's criteria, 30% of shoulder and knee MRIs estimated 20% of the annual imaging costs. Others are all over the place in the data between like 2% of what they look at retrospectively to 100% of studies. So I think that, oh, and that ethics survey actually uh, surveyed radiologists to say, what would you do uh, if you got that protocol request? And the vast majority said that I would, I'd reach out to the referring clinician and have a conversation with them. Though I'd say that this data seems incongruent with that to some extent, if this many studies are you know, inappropriate, but we're reaching out 97% of the time. And then on the IR side, Futility is kind of hard to define and study, but it's been estimated about 12% of uh, ICU admissions receive futile procedures, costing three to $9 million across every few months. And interestingly, it's been shown that doing a procedure that you perceive as futile is independently associated with burnout. That we like to think what we do helps people and it's really morally distressing to feel compelled to do something to someone that we feel is all risk and no benefit. Um, I'm gonna speed up a little bit here because I'm gonna run out of time on this case. I wanna leave a little bit more time for a little discussion. But just to say that defining futility is very hard because it's very qualitative and it's really based on people's values. So it's gonna vary depending on how people perceive what's a meaningful risk and benefit. Just to say that a single rigid definition is probably less helpful than a consistent approach of how we talk about these cases. And so, we did some studies in IR. The punchline is, is that most people do perceive this as a challenging issue, but some don't. Getting at that example I was saying of that if I can do the procedure well, it's not futile. People in academics and with more years of experience were more likely to perceive this as a meaningful issue. Common examples were like the one I gave with the G-tube, also multiple biliary drains with malignant obstruction. 
it's a complex issue because it's you're not just balancing the, the patient clinician. You also have these cultural factors like not wanting to disrupt referring patterns. We're usually not people's primary physician, fear of this conflict. So it's a hard issue to deal with. And so the question is, what can you do about it? Well, you know, on the diagnostic side, obviously I think it's worth at least like one conversation with the team to at least ask the question. I think we at least owe it to patients that much to be an advocate for them. And then on the IR side, there's a lot of data that at least having those conversations, you know, what's called advanced care planning, discussing with patient and families, you know, what are your goals? What are your values related to what's going on? Again, again, randomized control trials increases patient satisfaction and, and um, reduces stress, anxiety, and costs at the end of life. So I do think it's worth also asking that question and saying, has that conversation occurred? Because I think it's worth occurring, and I shared data last time sharing that showing that in a retrospective study of a bunch of IR procedures, it's, it's pretty rare, even those procedures where people die shortly after, that in the last three months, they've had any sort of that conversation documented. So I think that's kind of a low hanging fruit way that we can do that at a personal level. And the way that I have these conversations with people, if I'm gonna do it during my consent conversation, is I like to do this spot check where I kind of ask them what's going on to get a sense of where they're at and then drill into a little more about, you know, what, what bothers you most? Like what, what are you really, what are you most worried about? And then in US culture, there's really this tendency to do everything. And so it's helpful to normalize the other option of not doing as much. So with that biliary drain example, I like to use this some people phrase where, you know, we're talking about they're, they're like, I don't know if I want this like third biliary drain, they're already kind of miserable with the other. They say, you know, some people choose not to have another biliary drain and instead focus on comfort because that biliary drain is probably not gonna make you more comfortable. It's hope, the idea is to drive down your biliary movement to maybe get more chemo, but some people, some people make that transition over time and change their minds. And that, that can be really helpful for people if you, if you can do that for them. And then at a larger level, there's a few things. So some practices will partner with other services like that GTube example, there's a Kaiser group that partnered with Tide of Care to establish a policy to uh, not place gastroscopy tubes in people with advanced dementia because there is actually some data suggesting that causes more harm than good pretty consistently. But I think, you know, there's been work on this with the appropriateness criteria. Uh, but I ultimately think you're going to have to get creative, much like that consent example, and think more in terms of behavioral economics and changing what's called the choice architecture with this idea that rather than trying to convince people at a conscious level, also working at a subconscious level. So think about things like changing adapters so they don't fit. If you know the history of, of feeding tubes, it's kind of the, the birth of the NFIT adapter is the idea that it's not compatible with other types of tubes so that you can't attach the, the wrong thing to it. Um, so that is an example of that behavioral economics that you're, you're kind of forcing a function in a way. So I, I, my, my guess would be that we're probably gonna have to think more terms like that in the diagnostic radiology world to really advance this. But I do think the appropriateness criteria is, is probably a good start. Okay, so I probably wanted to leave some questions for discussion, but first I obviously have to thank you all. I, I love the invitation uh, from UVA. I, I really look up to you all. I tell uh, trainees all the time that they should go and train there, just so you know. I also am very thankful to Dr. Haskell, who I admire very much. I actually follow a lot of things that are written about him, and I was surprised to learn that he is uh, now at the University of West Virginia uh, School of Medicine in Charlottesville. So maybe he's moving moving to the Northwest. So, okay. Uh, so. I know it's more of a discussion between me and Dr. Haskell, but feel free in the chat also to, to share things that are uh, on your mind as well. And again, thank you very much for the honor. Eric, thank you much. That was, uh, that was fabulous. Um, I so appreciate having the opportunity to, um, to hear and to, and to hear again so that it continues to try to stick in my head this kind of basis of framework to try to think about this because we, we, as you said, we kind of feel like we have some instinctual ability to do this and make the right decision in the moment apropos of your, if you didn't learn this in church or wherever you're supposed to be invested with the golden rule and it all stops there, then we, we just kind of uh, figure it out on its own. And, uh, you know, this is a very ego-driven um, 
um, uh, a specialty. We have to be able to make decisions in order to deliver care. So sometimes we kind of get a little isolated in our own thoughts. Um, yeah. There, there really need to be more transparent mechanisms to be able to discuss these types of situations on a more regular basis, like you say, and separate them from some issues of fear and shame. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a lot of the, uh, the error processing that happens in hospitals where you try to have these group meetings to, to dissect and do analyses. Um, and yet, even in those situations, we have to admit that people get singed and the human aspect of using this as weaponizing these situations still tends to invade these if they're not properly managed. It's just a touchy subject, yep. you know? Yep. We're in, I, we're and I'm not, I haven't always been successful with this. It's been a lot of trial and error in trying this experiment of how do you talk about these topics in a way that is not off-putting to people because they are touchy topics. And sometimes they don't really have clear answers rather than just better or worse ones. Um, I, I do think it's been successful in the interventional world of doing that approach of trying this kind of conversational case-based examples where people really see themselves in that example. And they're like, yeah, I just had that referral last week. Um, so maybe in the diagnostic side, it's trying to get the foot in the door and try this at a conference and do a case-based thing, more focus kind of on this of things like, like misses, how do you do with inappropriate procedures? It's changing the language a little bit of saying like, even though we're talking about futility in a way, we're not using that word, you know? Um, and that's just that applied approach of being cognizant of the, the culture in which that decision is being made in. So I, I think that's probably the more productive way of doing it. Um, and yeah, you, 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 you also um, emphasize that as diagnostic radiologists that we should be comfortable elevating our position in these conversations rather than um, being an externality where we um, are the utilities. The study is ordered and therefore we will provide, but that um, um, we can have these delicate conversations with clinicians that may be very um, uh, appreciative of having a sounding board rather than perhaps on their own ordering isolated exams which seem logical and don't have the conversation from the other side. So there, there is a real role. Of course, this becomes far more challenging now as people move to remote reading situations and this isolation and separation of the whole movement of putting the radiologist in a glass room in front so clinicians can walk in is now disappearing behind sort of COVID locked doors and remote locations. So, you know, that um, I, this is going to become a lot harder potentially. I think so. You know, I, I moonlight as a teleradiologist, actually attending a teleradiologist. And most people are actually very appreciative when you reach out. Um, we are consultants. It's a different specialty or imaging consultants and saying, you know, I, I, I hear you that maybe you're going at this, you know, help me understand. It's kind of the way you approach it, right? You're not, you're not a jerk to them. But so much of this is a human, a, a human aspect. You know, you develop a relationship with people over time that allows you to be more comfortable you know, inserting yourself in the conversation and, and the, the separation of radiologists may make that harder. First to invest it with meeting for the radiologist who's busy at a remote location and then for having this, who is this on the phone or, or talking to me? I, and maybe I'm overstating the concern, but um, we, I, I think, think we need to be sensitive to it. I think it's, a, it's an extra challenge and I think it's gonna become more of a challenge, like you said. Um, and it's not a skill that we teach as well, going back to the education thing. We don't I don't think we really talk about this in radiology residency of how do you have a more productive conversation with a referring clinician about a potentially inappropriately ordered exam? Yeah. You know, there are better words. Interventional radiologist, your point about being more senior um, is an important one because um, there is a certain fortitude and then a certain um, ability to have these con conversations. I don't mean gravitas, but I mean just having a you know, some decades of uh, highlight reels of situations and environments that makes it easier to sort of speak from experience and then just engage in dialogue. And yep. one of the things that we have to remember is that we're also modeling this behavior for our colleagues and for our trainees as well, that these are kinds of situations where as you become more comfortable, you can engage as equals or at least as in the conversation. And, that, and that's a very important takeaway for people in earlier training. Yeah, the role modeling is is pivotal, and yeah, it, you know, it's it's easier with the seniority. I maybe I could pick on Bob Vogelzang at Northwestern. I was talking to him about futility or whatnot. Like, 
request for potentially inappropriate procedures. And he was like, Oh, I just say no. That's yeah. it. <laughs> you know? Um, and I was like, well, it's, it's easy because you built that respect, right? Like people see you to your point of that relationship and stuff. So they respect you and your seniority. When you say that it's harder, if you're a new career person, you have that distance and you're behind, you know, the, you're just the face on the name on the other side of the monitor. So. Yeah. Well said. Well, um, Eric, again, I really want to thank you for agreeing to come back. I, I so much admire the work that you're doing this, and um, I'm I'm crossing my fingers that we're going to see this uh, start to build into the uh, uh, diagnostic radiology curriculum at the levels of national U.S. conferences that it uh, deserves. It should be at the RSNA, but I'd also be happy to see it at the ECR. <laughs> Eric, thank you again. Thank you. Good evening, everyone.